Uh, yeah, so you probably know about the current West African uh, Ebola hemorrhagic fever outbreak uh, taking place in three different countries and it also uh, at some point spread into Nigeria and started spreading eastward from Nigeria um, into Cameroon. This is the biggest outbreak ever recorded of Ebola. Um, and usually Ebola is contained, when it, when it flares up in a human population, it's contained you know, somewhat quickly once we find out about it because it doesn't spread too far to too many villages or towns. And in this outbreak, it spread really quickly, um, and we didn't know about it for a long time, and it got into the urban centers, and it got into uh, in countries with very poor public health systems. Um, and uh, basically, there's always a reactive scramble to do something about it. And since the early 2000s, um, anthropologists have uh, been invited in because of the importance of understanding, local cultural understandings of, and perceptions of Ebola. It's cultural. In some countries, it is normal to eat monkey brains. No, it's cultural. So you have that. It's very difficult to actually change that because year, you know, um, decades after decades, hundred years, you know, centuries after centuries, that's what they've been doing. So it's it's natural, and it's hard for them to get away from that. So we're still, you know, medical experts are still. Um, trying to find out the truth about where Ebola comes from, where, where is that, that host. And uh, we're thinking now the most recent research suggests bats, mm -hmm. either frugivorous or insectivorous bats, right. because there's been some studies showing that bats infected with the Ebola virus mm -hmm. don't become symptomatic. Right. Okay, and then bats interact with their whole ecosystem, and humans are part of that ecosystem. Um, but oftentimes bats will infect things like primates. Mm -hmm. And then a primate, when they're um, affected, um, they will become symptomatic. Okay? So they get the same kind of symptoms that humans do and they'll start dying in the forest. And then if a hunter is in the forest and sees this, let's say, dead chimpanzee, they might take it because it's sort of like free bushmeat. They don't have to take a shot. And, you know, obviously it's easy to raise a chicken and have it make you eggs and then you can eat it after it's done. Um, but uh, in some countries they don't want to do that. They'd rather eat the bushmeat. And then when you're eating especially animals like chimpanzees that are 98% the same genetics as us, that can be problematic. And then when, when a hunter comes upon this, uh, this kind of free bush meat, they start to cut it up because that's how you transport it. And that's when the bodily fluids kind of start to change. And that's where you get the jump from, from the animal to the human. And so the hunter brings it back to the village where the, um, his wife or some, some women might further prepare the meat for selling. And so now she's infected with it. And then the hunter who is also affected is now interacting with his children and other people in the village. And so that's how it spreads. And then they start getting sick. And you don't know what it is. And it goes from there. So we think it starts with bats and then it starts kind of permeating throughout the rest of the community, um, the animal, some of the animal communities, and then transfers to humans. In this instance, this current outbreak, it was, we think, an interaction between a two-year-old boy, I think in Guinea, I believe, um, and, a, and a tree that was full of bats. And they actually burned the tree because they, they eat bat meat, and they were um, interacting with these bats, and the child was patient zero, we think. And then everyone who interacted with that child um, was affected, and that's how it first spread. Um, and so now as Ebola was spreading across Nigeria into Cameroon, uh, I work in Cameroon right on the border with Nigeria, it was reported that there were a lot of rumors spreading about what were the causes and consequences of Ebola. And I studied bushmeat hunting and bushmeat trading and protected area management. And so it was reported, r reportedly that people started to, you know, kind of basically kind of freak out a little bit, you know, as you can understand. And they stopped uh, or they reduced their hunting, they reduced trading, especially of certain species, and people were afraid to consume certain species. So we wanted to know more about how people understand the Ebola virus and other zoonotic infectious diseases, how they perceive their risk of getting Ebola and other zoonotic infectious diseases, and, um, and then assess their actual risk of getting Ebola based on their behaviors. Um, and then build what we call biocultural models, and which is what um, medical anthropologists have been doing for the last little bit less than a decade. Um, and so build this sort of local biocultural models to help us understand how local understandings can inform medical interventions and then develop um, specific uh, cultural education programs 
So first, you know, local people educate us about what they know about Ebola and, and how they deal with it. Um, and then we build education programs based on that local knowledge and our knowledge and the biomedical knowledge. And so we can better prepare local communities and governments to deal with Ebola or other um, kinds of outbreaks.